I'm a, I'm a collector of dots. I write about storage, and the dots I write about are events in the storage industry, like a new product announcement, somebody suing somebody, a CEO changing company, and that sort of thing. So I have this sort of microscope. I look at a dot and I write a story around it. But there's a side effect of that in that I sometimes connect the dots. Now, I'm just, I, I'm just a hack, right? What do I know? But I can see that if I connect dot one to dot two to dot three, a picture emerges. And so this is the picture that's emerging to me at the moment. Now, it's just a possible picture. I may be talking rubbish. So give me 15, 20 minutes of your time and then make up your own mind whether I'm talking rubbish. Now, there are two reasons, I think, why flash could replace disk. That's performance and that's capacity. And disk, I think, has problems in both areas. And one of them is the capacity area because it's tremendously difficult to give disks substantially more capacity. You've got a fixed enclosure with a fixed number of platters inside it. You can get one-time hits by having helium inside the platter, so you, inside the enclosure, so you can get an extra platter. Otherwise, you have to do clever things with the recording technology to try and increase data capacity. So this is shingling. The idea that you've got write tracks which are wider than read tracks. So if you overlap the write tracks to the point where you still leave a readable read track, you can get more tracks on the disk. Clever idea. Maybe get an extra 20, 30% more capacity. Problem is, because of this overlapping, when you rewrite data in one track, it affects the track it's overlapping. So you rewrite the data in that track, which affects the track it's overlapping. You end up going the whole disk. So what they've done, they put tracks in blocks with a gap between the blocks. So you have to rewrite a block of tracks when you rewrite data. It slows performance. So you get a capacity boost at the cost of slower write performance. Not a good deal, really, for primary data. What can you else can you do? You move to a new recording technology which gives you smaller bits. And the problem with current PMR technology is that the bits are getting so small that they're affected by the magnetic value of the neighboring bit. And you get electron drift as well, and all, so on and so forth. So eventually, the bits become so small, you can't rely on the data being there that you wrote a few moments ago. So what you do, you move to a more stable magnetic recording material, which you've got to heat before you can write it. And once you've written to this material and it's cooled down, then it's stable. You can have smaller bits. Problem is, the read-write head has got to have a laser in it. And this is really fancy technology, because the laser's got to be heating a precise spot for a precise amount of time so you can do your write and then it moves on and the spot's got to cool so that it doesn't affect the next spot. Really difficult to do. Seagate think they might have the technology out 2018 and by then it will probably be the same capacity as the current PMR, Perpendicular Magnetic Recording Technology, that we use today in its iteration in 2018. So one, possibly two generations further on. In other words, it's tremendously difficult to do and it's not going to give you an immediate capacity advantage. Oh, now, I just tried with a frigging laser. <laughs> <laughs> I just not drive not with not. a freaking laser. It's, it's amazing technology, isn't it? I mean, we used to be thinking about a Boeing 747 flying at two inches above ground level at 500 miles an hour. Now it's heating buildings as it passes over them. It's This, this stuff is free amazing. But at the same time, flash technology hit its own wall. And there are several walls it was hitting. Now, on the bottom line, we've got the cell geometry. Now, forgive me here. I'm really a back of an envelope sort of person. I'm not an engineer. But if we say 5x nanometers is 59 to 50 nanometers on the side of a cell. Think of cells in flashes being square. So that's a symmetric square with 59 to 50 nanometer sizes. And the columns of different types of flash. So the blue column is one bit per cell or single level cell flash, which is the fastest and has the longest endurance. Then there's MLC, two bits per cell flash, which has slightly lower speed, slightly less endurance. Then the yellow column is TLC flash, three bits per cell. 
lower speed still, substantially less endurance. And then the red column there for theory is QLC, four bits per cell flash, quad level cell, which has lowest endurance of all and the lowest performance. Now, as you move to 3x geometry, and then to 2x, and then to 1x, you can see what happens. The speed goes down, but more importantly, the endurance goes down catastrophically. Yeah, they've, they've gone to asymmetric cell sizes. Now, we've got 16 nanometer cells coming out from Toshiba and SanDisk, and that's probably about as far as we can go. 16 nanometer SLC, 16 nanometer MLC will probably be okay, or are okay, but 16 nanometer TLC is probably only good for USB sticks and cameras. It's not good enough for enterprise storage. You can do so much with digital signal processing controllers, Remember, Apple bought Anabit? That was Anabit's technology, digital signal processing for flash controllers. You can do so much with fancier error correction and so on, but this is the basic situation you've got, and it's a war. What do you do? Now, the various post NAND technologies being suggested, resistance, RAM, phase change memory, and so on and so forth, none of them are in production phase today, it meaningful production. This Cross-point RAM, cross-point memory from Intel and Micron, but that's not being positioned as a flash replacement. It's being positioned as a new level in the memory storage hierarchy inside servers as memory, persistent memory, not as storage. So this is a problem flash has got. Something needed to give. And it's come up with 3D flash. We take current flash, planar or two-dimensional flash, and layer it one above the other. Samsung have got there first. They've got 32 layer 3D flash out now. Lovely. You have the same footprint for a flash chip, but you layer it up and you get more capacity. 32 layers now, 48 coming, 128 in prospect. <clears throat> so whatever Samsung are doing with their 32 layer flash chips now, we're looking at four times more capacity in the same footprint. We'll get there. We'll get there slowly, but you're right, absolutely right. Now, I heard something. <laughs> what, what Samsung has done as well, which I think partly was to ease the problem of making 3D chips. Because if you think about it, if you have 32 layers of flash on one chip, then the room for error you've got when you deposit layer one is pretty high. Layer two, it's got to be precisely above layer one. So you get to layer 32, and you've got anything out of step, you just lost the whole chip. So they stepped back the cell size. They went back to a 4X cell size, 49 to 40 nanometer, which had the byproduct of making TLC flash enterprise level endurance. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that sweet? Um, it's lovely stuff. So, you can say to yourself, MLC flash today is killing performance disk. If you have a choice between 15,000 RPM disk and an MLC flash chip, then by and large you go for a flash chip. And if you don't believe me, talk to Mr. Caminario who will take you off to one side and hit you over the head with his array. <laughs> then you can say, okay, so we've got 3D TLC and that's got enterprise satisfactory endurance, and it's still a hell of a lot faster than disk. So maybe that could start replacing 10,000K disk drives, notebook disk drives, and also performance disk drives in storage arrays these days as well. So what happens if 3D QLC comes along, if that has satisfactory enterprise endurance? And the pricing's right, well then maybe it could kill 7,200 RPM disk drives. In which case you start thinking, well, maybe violin's right. Maybe an all-flash data center is actually a possibility. Now, the guys from Exagrid, Exagrid at the back, are saying, you're talking pot. You don't know your backside from your elbow. No way are we going to sell your arrays with 3D QLC flashing them as backup targets. Well, maybe you will. Maybe you'll use 3D QLC flashing them as backup targets. 
and then you'll have your fast restore time and blinding fast backup time simultaneously. I mean, I'm just connecting dots here, right? I don't know whether I'm right, but boy, is it an attractive picture. <laughs> <laughs> There's something else going on, I think, as a background to this. This is another dot connecting session. I think storage wants to be inside servers, really. I mean, we used to load data back in the old days from punch cards and paper tape. And then along some came somebody saying, ah, oh, we've got this magnetic disk, magnetic tape. And somebody who was an ancestor of Howard Marks said, no, 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 it's, like, it's only for the 1%. Nobody will, you know what I'm saying? And so magnetic tape took over from that, <coughs> and then disk took over from that. But unfortunately, the servers, my God, they got multi-core, they got multi-socket, they got virtualized, and suddenly a disk array can't keep up. It's like a tap, and at the other end of the line is somebody wanting a fire hose of data. So, there's this been this great gap between storage on the one hand, which is persistent, and server memory on the other hand, which is volatile. Well, suppose the two can come together. And that's this 3D cross-point memory idea. Now, NAND can't do that. Well, actually, maybe it can. You give yourself a non-volatile memory accessed SSD, talking by an NVMe fabric link, and you've got yourself NAND in the server's memory address space with some software tweaks and so on. My, my dots here are getting quite set far apart, right? But this is somewhere that disk cannot go at all. Disk has lost the performance game already. Disk future is a capacity game. And I think that with 3D TLC and 3D QLC, disk is poised to lose the capacity game. At the Flash Memory Summit in August, Samsung demonstrated a 16 terabyte SSD using three-dimensional TLC memory. So, okay, it's a demo, but we'll see it next year. 16 terabyte SSD. The, fasti or rather the largest capacity disk drive we've got today is a 10 terabyte one from Hitachi using helium. Sorry? Go back one slide. No, that's actually the system you can buy, which is... Which yes, Mangstore. No, 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 it's a server that you can... There is? We'll see you afterwards, please. <laughs> Unless, uh, now, so here's a possibility, right, that 3D, that MLC kills 15K disk drives, 3D TLC kills 10K disk drives, 3D QLC kills 7.2K disk drives. No more disk drives in the data center. That's, that's the scenario. And because of that, <laughs> spin no more disk drives, you are dead. <laughs> now, I don't know whether this is right, but boy, it's an attractive looking proposition. It's nice to write about, but is it for real? Are we at the same stage in disk drive technology advancement as tape was? when disk drives began to be commercially off-the-shelf available hardware products. And it might be a hard argument to say, we're not. And that disk drives will succeed. Where tape drives fail to stem disks, disk will succeed in stemming flash. I don't know.